We'll have to wait and see. It is Mississippi after all. I am not Will Ross. I'm Dawn Roger, and we welcome you to Marvin United Methodist Church in our worship service. We'd like to wish a happy birthday this week to Beth Smyra, Caitlin Shannon, and Isabella Pickett. Find the attendance books there on the end of each pew. Please be sure they make their way down. Everybody signs in so we can keep our accurate records. Okay. And our app lights have changed. This morning we have Georgia Bexley. Did I get it right, Georgia? As our app light. <coughs> And Kennedy Bishop. Our nursery worker is Sherry Bishop. Our team and stewards will meet this afternoon at one in the parlor, and there will be no evening activities. Our youth are still away on overflow retreat. They'll be coming home tomorrow. We ask that you continue to be in prayer for them as well as the chaperones attending with them. This Wednesday, we'll have choir practice at 5.30 in the choir room, and the youth will meet at 6. Next Sunday, January 21st, our ministry's leadership will be meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the choir room. We ask that, please, if you are on this committee, any committee, please be in attendance for this meeting. We're going to begin planning our 2024 year and your input is very important to what happens in the church this upcoming year. Please don't forget to look over our sign-up sheets in the fellowship hall for opportunities to serve the Lord, Marvin, and our community. We have sign-up sheets for cakes and huge meals. We have sign-up sheets for um, helping with the nursery, for helping with Sunday school classes, and also for um, flowers for the sanctuary, and other volunteer opportunities. Our neck of the woods 4-H will be having their bingo fundraiser on Saturday, February 3rd. I put that's a pretty far out date, but I wanted everyone to be aware. I personally have attended the last two, and it is a lot of fun. It's a good time to enjoy fellowshipping and just having fun. And as you know, that a percentage of what they make in their fundraising, they contribute to Love in the Bag for the church. And it makes a tremendous difference in how our Love in the Bag mission proceeds throughout the rest of the year. You'll be getting more information on that, flyers, and et cetera, in the near future. And there, I think there's going to also be a silent auction like they've done in the past. That too is a lot. You get some good things that day. <laughs> Please be sure to go to your bulletin early so that you don't miss any upcoming events. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Having none, let us quiet our hearts as we prepare for worship. And may the Lord be with you.
faithfulness. Good morning, church. This grace is abundant, and His mercies are new every single morning. Let's stand as we join together and sing our call to worship this morning on page 2070. As a faith we sing, He is exalted.
acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it all together. You pursue me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Whither shall I go from your spirit? Or whither shall I be from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me, and the light about me might be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You made me together as my mother's wood. I praise you, for you are fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. You know me very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written the days that were formed for me, every day before they came into being. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the same. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who maliciously defy you, who lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate them that hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe them that rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way. opportunity to worship and to give back. <coughs> Lord, as we give back, we pray, Lord, that you respond with a blessing. Lord, of your peace in our hearts, of your blessing in all aspects of our lives, and that, Lord, of what we give, may you further it, grow it, bless it for your service here on earth and us in your kingdom. In Christ's holy name, amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge his wicked and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. And Ms. Desi and Tyler this morning, as they are up with the youth at Camp Lake Stevens, and they will be coming home this afternoon, is the new information, at 4 o'clock. Is that correct? So we've got Adrian Rayner filling in. We appreciate Adrian. So we invite the young and the young at heart, if you'd like to come down front for the children's message. traveling. We keep them in our thoughts and we pray for them. Uh, we're missing our youth and some of our counselors as they are up at 
um, Overflow, which is a spiritual life retreat at Camp Lake Stevens in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The leadership up there said that they were going to shut down early uh, because of the weather. And so our youth are coming home this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And so um, we'll just keep in touch with them as, as they can phone ahead and tell us when they're going to be here. But keep them in your, in your prayers as, as uh, they're up there and they're learning about God and learning about each other. Um, and if you haven't heard, it's going to get cold. I think winter is here. I hope everybody's got their pipes wrapped. You've got your gas tanks filled. And, uh, you're just ready for this. And if you're not, let somebody know so we can come help you. Uh, but seriously, I think it's supposed to get freezing on Monday and not uh, get above freezing until Wednesday. We're talking about deep freeze, too. So, um, and also, uh, when we pray for the decisions of our uh, Rankin County School District, uh, Tuesday morning, nobody knows what's going to happen, whether we're going to have class or not. But we might get a little frozen stuff. So we'll have to see. So, y'all tell me something good. What are we celebrating? We had 15 in Sunday school today. 15 in Sunday school. Yeah, that's okay to clap. Yeah. <laughs> Celebrate. Anybody else? Anybody happy that they're warm and dry? Don't forget to celebrate all the little things. We may not be warm and dry come Tuesday morning. Celebrate all those little things. Uh, I'm watching our acolytes down here. They're doing such a good job. You know, they're just y'all are just about experts at this by now. They're, they've got all the moves down. They know what's going on. I appreciate all of them. Uh, and as we uh, as we come together, it's it's a long weekend. It's a weekend where we celebrate some of the history of of what's been going on in our nation. As we remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but we also remember a lot of our past. And so it is a time of reflection. As we do this, we, we realize that there's a lot of folks that aren't here among us. Uh, Phil Armitrout, of course, Ann's with him. Carolyn Biddle. Uh, we've been praying for Leonard Blanton, but uh, um, Vera, his wife's birthday is today. Uh, Nancy Burkett's been in and out of the hospital, but uh, continue to remember her. Margie Cumberland, uh, just continuing to be there. We continue to remember Bet and, and, of course, Jeff. Uh, we miss Eddie Ray and Martha so much. We we remember Susan as she takes. I'm sorry, Suzanne as she takes care of them. Uh, Don's parents, Bernice Morrison, Blanche. Anybody want to give an update on Blanche? Uh, she's doing pretty good. She's back at uh, she's over at Fire at Edgewood. Edgewood. And mm -hmm. uh, she's doing pretty good there. She's comfortable. She's in and out of what you can say calls, but she's doing okay. Kind of sleepy these days. Uh, Roger and Linda. Y'all keeping up with Roger and Linda? Uh, we have a lot of folks that, that we haven't seen in a while. Give them a call. Write them a card. Say hi. Be the church. Uh, let's pray for each other. Um, come on. Remember, remember Ella and her son Mike? There's a lot of folks. And if we start naming names, you know, we can, we can be here for a long time. That's fine. Anybody else got that, somebody that they want to lift up? Who else will we remember? Evening. Yes, ma'am. My daughter, Gwen in Virginia, has RSV and has been in and out of hospital this week, so I appreciate prayers on her behalf for okay. her health. <clears throat> All right, daughter in Virginia. Y'all keep your hands clean. Take care of yourselves. It is a blessing to be able to gather in God's name. It is a blessing to be warm. It is a blessing to be dry. It's a blessing to get in the car and to be able to be here. Don't forget that. As we live into these blessings, as we give thanks to God, don't forget to share. To share the love that Christ has given us, because that's what the church is about. Is we represent Jesus in our midst. If you, need some, if you know somebody that needs some help with uh, wrapping their pipes, let us know. We'll do the best we can. So let's be the church. Let's unite our hearts. And as we pray, the Lord be with you.
God, thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name. As we come, we are burdened with so much that spins in our minds, so many decisions that we have to make, so many things that we worry about. Lord, we're burdened in our hearts as we, we worry about the things that we can't control. As we lift people up, Lord, as we wish that we could see your actions, your face here on this earth, and we even wonder where you are at times. Lord, we come as your people, needing to hear your words once again, because it kind of seems like a dark world sometimes, especially when you're not there. Lord, speak to us in our heart of hearts. Open our eyes, open our ears, open all that we are to the power of your presence. Lord, that we may be refreshed, that we may be renewed, that we may be forgiven, that we may be strengthened to be your church. And that in this world, those that live in darkness may see a little light in us, and that they may know that light's for themselves. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. For Lord, when we can't do anything else, we unite our voices together, and we pray and remember how you taught us when you said, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
1 Samuel chapter 3, if you want to join me. It's another good story of beginnings as we begin our year. It's the beginning of Samuel's ministry. Samuel is a special person, probably one of the least talked about in the Bible. But Samuel's so special, he's got two books of the Bible named after him. Think about it, First and Second Samuel. Samuel represents the transition, a time of transition and style of leadership between the priests and the prophets to the kings. Samuel was a priest, but he was also a prophet. And he is the one that is asked by God to ordain the kings. First of all, Saul, tall Saul, but then, of course, King David. And the leadership and the style of, of government begins to change throughout all of Israel. And Samuel is the one to watch it all happen and to bring it all into place. Samuel is special because he's a Nazarite. Anybody know what a Nazarite is? We don't talk about this a whole lot. Maybe you've had a, a Sunday school lesson about Nazarites. I got, I got some folks back here nodding about Nazarites. And Nazarite is not a Nazarene. A Nazarene is somebody from Nazareth. But a Nazarite is a child that was born and raised special and dedicated to God. Usually the story of the mother of the Nazarite is that she was unable to bear children and she had a special prayer and she, she cried out to God for a blessing and when God did bless her with a child, she dedicated it to God's service. And along the way, they did not eat or drink, eat, or drink of anything that was strong. No liquor or nothing of that nature. And they didn't cut their hair. Samson. Remember Samson the judge? Long hair. He was a Nazarite. And even though we might talk about Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus wasn't really a Nazarite. Although I think there's some traditions that want to argue that he was. But his cousin John the Baptist was a Nazarite. And so Samuel was born. To a mother who desperately wanted a child and could not get that blessing. But when she did, she gave thanks to God so much she dedicated that child to God's service. And she gave him over to Eli and the priesthood to raise him up to be a high priest and to help in the service of the Lord. Now let's talk about Eli a little bit. Because Eli was the high priest at the time and he is kind of the decline of the high priest. Eli was getting much older, losing control of the, the governance, and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they really did evil in the eyes of the Lord. People would come to offer sacrifice, and they would extort things from them, and they would take it, they really wouldn't sacrifice it, they'd keep it for themselves, and they'd sell it. So the temple had become a place of abuse, and God was not happy with Eli. So in the midst of this, young Samuel, who has never heard of God's voice in their lives. We have these children down here. Have you heard God speak? No. It's okay. It takes a lot of spiritual work to listen to God to speak to you in your heart. It takes a lot of time, and there's a lot of adults that have not been able to listen to God speak to them and to understand that in their time. So it's totally fine. Young Samuel did not understand God's voice. But let's read that story in 1 Samuel, starting in chapter 3. The boy, Samuel, ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. Things were grown dark. There were not many visions. One night, and Eli, whose eyes were be going, becoming to grow weak so that he could barely see, he was laying down in his, in his usual place. And the lamp of, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Now, the lamp of God is the holy place because Samuel is in the worship area. So we need to say it again. The lamp of God has not gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple, the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And the Lord called Samuel. Is that what God's called Samuel? Samuel? Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. And so he went, and he lay down. And again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up, and he went to Eli, and he said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Quit waking me up. <laughs> Go back and lie down. 
Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, you called me. But then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lay down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and he stood there calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hear it tingle. And at that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and he was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called to him and said, Samuel, my son? Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it that he said to you? Eli said, Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And then Samuel said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. And the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Beloved, it's the word of God for the people of God. Let the people say, Thanks be to God. Lord, speak to us once again that we may know and that we may hear your voice and live in the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks in Christ's name. This is a story of the calling of Samuel, but it's also a story of discernment. Discernment being listening to God's voice. I mean, how do we hear God's voice? How do we know it's God's voice that's leading us? How do we know that God's voice is carrying us into the future that is right and that is correct and that God wants us to be a part of? Discernment is usually part of all the decisions, the big decisions that we have to make. Everybody eventually has to make some big decisions. Hard decisions, decisions that have an uncertain future, decisions you worry about and pray about and cry about and anguish about, and you pray that somehow, somewhere, God will speak to you and give you direction in your life. Y'all remember those decisions, don't you? How about decisions to get married? Ooh. How about for some of us, decisions to divorce? How about decisions about your calling in this world, your vocation. We have a lot of seniors in high school right now that are trying to make a decision about what school to further their education at. How about decisions about what you're going to put your life towards? You know, a vocation, again, is the word vocal. It's a calling. God is calling to lead us and to drag us in the, in the right direction because if you just got a job or you're changing your, your time for some money, that can weigh on your spirit. It can break your back. It can break your soul. But when you live into your calling, oh, every day is fulfillment because you're working for God. And what a blessing it is. Doesn't mean it's easy. But it does mean you wake up and you say, wow, I'm so glad that I'm doing what God wants me to do. We've got all kinds of decisions to make. This year we're going to have to make a decision about a president. We've been in constant discernment about being a part of the United Methodist Church or not. We have decisions about what's Marvin United Methodist Church going to do this year in ministry. And I do hope that everybody that's a part of one of these uh, meetings will, will come to our ministry leadership meeting to help us to discern what does God have for Marvin United Methodist Church. We can't do this without you. And so we have to learn, we have to put ourselves in that place. 
How do you hear God's voice anyhow? I'll give you a hint. You can't do it if you can't be in prayer and if you aren't in some kind of study and if you aren't in a fellowship of Christians to discuss and to debate and to hold one another accountable. You have to spend time with God before you learn to hear God's voice. Samuel and John have yet known the Lord. These young folks down here listening to Miss Adrian who has the voice of wisdom. They don't yet know the Lord in that sense, but, but Adrian's wise enough to know that every day we have decisions where we, we realize God is with us and we have to make those decisions. Do we reach out to somebody in kindness? Do we help somebody in loneliness? Can we be the church? Kids aren't theological. They just understand the love of Christ and they understand the love that we share with them. And that's great. That's all it has to be. But we all have to discern. Samuel hears God's voice, but he doesn't recognize. He has to turn around and go back to Eli and say, Eli, are you calling me? And Eli's like, leave me alone. I'm trying to sleep. Y'all ever had somebody wake you up in the middle of the night? Leave me alone. But finally, Samuel understood that something special was going on here. It took the nurturing spirit of an elder to guide young Samuel into saying, yes, Lord, here I am. Your servant. There's a lot of hard decisions that we have to make. And we pray and we struggle constantly with trying to make the right decision and the right guidance that we have to make. And as I think about throughout history, there's been lots of people that have had to make hard decisions. And on this weekend, where we remember Dr. Martin Luther King, you think about some of the decisions that he had to make. And all the opposition that was against him at that time. 1963, Birmingham, Alabama, it's Holy Week. The church is about to celebrate Easter. And a, a co coalition that was coming to Birmingham to try and change the laws, to try and bring to knowledge of the world of the, the harm that was happening to people with dark skin, they would have sit-ins in the, at the counters. And they were being arrested, or they they had picket with signs, and, and they were filling the jails, but there was a plan. People were mortgaging their houses to make to bond them out of jail. And as more people got in jail, there was just no more money. And so the people that were around Martin Luther King and some of the other ministers, they said, We gotta stop this. Nothing's happening, nothing's changing. And all that we're out of money. And guess what? It's Easter, brother. I've had churches at home. They want to come home and they want to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. And here we are and nothing's changing. And so the leadership, Dr. Martin Luther King and some of the others, they got together and they were holding a meeting and they were praying about God's discernment and God's direction. They didn't know what to do. And somebody brought from them a newspaper, the Birmingham Gazette. And in that newspaper, there was an advertisement and the advertisement was an open letter to Dr. Martin Luther King and all the people that said that his movement was untimely and he needed to cease and desist. When I think about that letter, I think about the people that signed that letter. These were not people of dark skin, of course. These were white leadership, white Christian leadership. Not all of them. There's one Jewish leader. And they were in discernment too. And they were worried about their future, and they were worried about the church, and they were worried about the people. And so, in their discernment, they wrote to tell him to stop. Yes, it's possible that Christians can disagree. <laughs> yes, it's possible that Christians can get it wrong. Yes, it's possible that even pastors cannot hear the word of God when God is speaking. Here's some of the people that signed that letter. A non-denominational bishop named C.J. Carpenter. Uh, the Roman Catholic bishop of the Diocese of Mobile, Joseph Durick. Rabbi Hilton Grossman of Temple Emmanuel. Uh, the Episcopal Diocese bishop, George Burry. Uh, the um, moderator of the Presbyterian Synod, Edward Romage. And also the pastor of First Baptist Church of Birmingham, Earl Stallings, all had 
discerned that this was a bad thing, and so they wrote to shut it down. But lest I take on my other sisters and brothers in other denominations, two Methodist bishops as well, Bishop Holden Harmon of the North Alabama Conference of the Methodist Church, this is before United Methodism, and also Bishop Paul Harden of the Alabama West Florida Conference. Now, as I think about that, I want to bring up Paul Harden specifically because Paul Harden was a retired bishop who was a bishop emeritus at Emory University while I was studying in seminary. And I actually had classes under the man. And I knew that he was one of the ones that had signed the letters that were sent to Dr. Martin Luther King and the other ministers to say their movement was untimely. And I never, I didn't have the courage or either, I just didn't want to embarrass the man by calling him out in the middle of class. But I did go to his office. I said, Bishop Harmon, I know you were one of the ones that signed the letter. This is 1990. 30 years after the fact. We kind of know how history played out. It's easy to be armchair quarterbacks here and now looking backwards. But do you think you made the right decision or, or how do you look back on that? How do you feel about that? And he said to me, we were all scared. We were all worried and all we saw was chaos and all we saw was pain. And we wanted it to stop. And so we did the best that we could. That was the man's answer. I think that's an honest answer. I think that's a human answer. Who doesn't want pain to stop? But as we listen to the discernment of things, sometimes we have to do the hard thing. Samuel heard the prophecy of the end of Eli's time as high priest. And Eli said, now you tell me what God said and don't hold anything back. Samuel had to do the hard thing and tell him God's going to change everything. God's going to make everything different. But guess what? It's going to be God's. Remember, the light had not gone out in the temple. Maybe things had been dark. Maybe people had not heard the word of the Lord in a long time. But God was doing a new thing and the light had not gone out. And Samuel was the spark of the newness of a new generation of priests and prophets that led us into the kings like King David. And even though we may struggle with our discernments in our humanity, we have to take hold of the fact that the light of Christ has not gone out in our hearts. The light of Christ continues and the darkness has not overcome it. Can I get an amen? Come on, folks. I know I'm talking about hard things, but I'm trying to give you some encouragement that this is not over and this is not done. Christ has not abandoned us. And we have to look for that light. How do we discern this calling? How do we discern God's will in our lives? Because when Dr. King was with that group and they were praying, it was Good Friday. And a lot of those folks just wanted to go home and have church. It was Easter. And Dr. King went back to his back bedroom and he got down on his knees and he prayed. And he felt like God spoke to his heart. And he made the choice to do the hard thing. And when he came out of the room, he wasn't wearing a suit to preach his Good Friday sermon. He was wearing boots and blue jeans. And he said, y'all, let's walk together. Peacefully, let's let the world know the wrongs that are happening here so that Christ may be illuminated. I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. But he was trying to change things for his people. And not just his people, but for all people. Because when you read the letter in the Birmingham jail after it was written, he basically writes, if we're not free, nobody's free. Freedom of Christ is for all. But as we discern, what are the things that we can use to help guide us? Guide us into these hard decisions. We have to know that Christ's presence, that light that is inside us, goes with us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And if we live by the Spirit, we know God's voice in our hearts. But if we live into the ways of the flesh, we live contrary to the Spirit. <laughs> Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Does this sound like anything you've heard of recently? Does this sound like our country? 
Does this sound like our church? Woo! We can preach on this. But if we are to follow the discernment of God who speaks to our hearts, who leads us in his righteousness, we are led with what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Folks, the light of Christ has not gone out. It has not gone out in your heart. It has not gone out in my heart. It has not gone out in Marvin United Methodist Church. It has not gone out in anything that God is a part of. Let's hang on to that. History has shown that discernment is a difficult thing. And that we are humans, God help us. But let us be led by the spirit of life that is in all of us, that comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for the elders that have gone before us, that have showed us how to struggle, that have showed us how to be human, that have taken stands, whether right or whether wrong, Lord, have tried to be led in your grace. So guide us in this year, that Marvin, that us, we may be your church, we may be your people, that we may be your faith in this world. We give you thanks. In Christ our own. Amen. Our closing hymn is on page 338, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. 338 in your hymn, I'll invite you to stand if we sing. <laughs>